There are thousands of pieces of space junk orbiting the Earth right now. How can we make space safer? Find out in today's episode. Three, two, one. Welcome to Your Space Journey, where we venture into the future of space exploration. Your journey begins now. Thanks for joining me for Your Space Journey. In today's episode, we'll explore the growing problem of space junk and how the new company, Privateer Space, is working to help make space safer. Joining us today is Dr. Moriba Ja, the chief scientist of Privateer. Moriba is a co-founder of Privateer, along with the company's CEO, Alex Fielding, and the company's president, Steve Wozniak. Moriba is a renowned astrodynamicist, a space environmentalist, and an associate professor at the University of Texas. As Privateer's chief scientist, he is the visionary behind Privateer's innovative technology that will help make space operators to maneuver safely and effectively as orbital highways continue to become even more congested. Your space journey. More of a, I've been so impressed. One of your recent TED Talks, you mentioned um, that as an astrodynamicist, uh, you can compare what you do to the awesome character Rich Purnell in in the movie The Martian. I, I love that analogy. Can you describe for your audience what what is an astronaut dynamicist? What do you do? Yeah, so uh, astrodynamics is the science that studies motion of stuff in space. And so basically, you know, we try to say, look, if we have some satellite, rocket body, or you know, planet, asteroid, whatever, and it's in space, and there's a bunch of other bodies. And this thing is subject to all sorts of forces. How's the thing going to behave? Is it going to tumble? How's it going to tumble? How's it going to move? Uh, predict where the thing is going to be a week from now, months, years from now, that sort of thing. Excellent. Well, one thing, I, I want, before we talk about just that amazing field, I do want to go back because one thing we love to do is we'd love to talk about people's space journeys. And you particularly have a very interesting story. Um, I, you know, I believe you were born in the U.S. Then as a young child, you moved to Venezuela, uh, then later became a member of the U.S. Air Force, I believe, and you had a very interesting experience in, in Montana that sort of uh, piqued your interest in space. I was wondering if you could describe that a little bit more. Yeah, look, I mean, um, so I went to a, a military boarding school in Venezuela and um, that instilled a lot of structure and discipline, these things uh, in my life. But yeah, after graduating from there, I came back to the United States and enlisted in the US Air Force and I became a security policeman. And um, part of my duties as a security policeman were to uh, guard intercontinental ballistic missiles in Montana. And, um, you know, having grown up in Caracas, Venezuela, Caracas is a multi-million person city with, uh, you know, high, high, high towers, skyscrapers, lots of lights. And so on a good night, on a good night in Caracas, you might be able to see the moon. You don't see a whole lot more than that. And um, I'd never in my life until Montana, I'd never been in a place with such dark skies. And uh, doing my night shifts in Montana, I was extremely mesmerized with the night sky and felt very connected. It's like, uh, I'm like, wow, we're not alone in the universe. Like the universe is populated. Like everywhere I look, it's just, you know, dots of light. And um, which was really cool. But then I noticed that uh, there were dots of light that were actually moving. Um, they weren't planes, they weren't uh, meteors. And some of these dots of light were disappearing in the middle of the sky. Made me think I was crazy. I thought these things might be UFOs. I didn't have any other explanation. Uh, maybe God was trying to talk to me in, in, in some mysterious way. And um, by really chasing my curiosity a little bit, turns out that these things uh, were human-made objects in Earth orbit reflecting sunlight. And when they disappeared in the middle of the skies because they went through Earth's uh, shadow. They became eclipsed by the Earth, and so they weren't shining light anymore. And uh, I was like, wow, I think I need to know more about that. See, I think that's 
incredible more and i was thinking too sometimes i just wish everyone could see what it's like because you know i grew up in the city too lots of light pollution you know see three stars if you're lucky or the moon and then to be transported and look up and see the the universe in its its glory and see things that you just can't explain until you know it is it, something amazing is that what sort of led you into again another wonderful thing that you do is space environmentalist yeah so the the idea of, of space environmentalism for me uh came out of you know the the work that i did on maui so i worked for nasa jet propulsion lab out of uh, graduate school so from like 1999 to like 2006 is when i worked for jpl but then uh yeah went to maui in 2006 to work for the air force research laboratory so my focus shifted away from mars missions to stuff orbiting the earth and given some of the so two things one Telescopes on top of Mount Haleakala uh, track things orbiting the Earth. And I became acquainted with Earth's space debris problem. And it was like 96% of all the things that we were tracking, we were tracking a couple tens of thousands of pieces ranging in size from cell phone to the space station at the time. 96% um, of that was garbage, like, you know, uh, pieces of broken uh, satellites, rocket bodies, and these sorts of things. And that juxtaposed with uh, how on Maui, you have native Hawaiians that embrace uh, stewardship and interconnectedness, and you have colonialism, which went more towards ownership of things and the detriment of that mentality and how Maui maximizes single use plastics and has landfills. So I think a seed got planted. I started seeing uh, direct analogies between lack of sustainability in ocean, land, and then space. Um, and then a, a couple of years later, I, I went to Alaska, uh, took my son Denali there with me so he could see where his name came from and mm -hmm. saw some very similar things there. And I had a inner shift, my, 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 inner, sh my inner space shifted. And um, um, I felt an inner calling to try to, I guess, prevent humanity from forgetting this intergenerational contract of stewardship and that all things are interconnected and would I be willing to do anything I could to do that and so a space environmentalist was born. I, I, I truly I, I love that I think it's so neat and it's one of those subjects that unfortunately I think we put our blinders on a lot you know we think of you know space debris space junk I mean you mentioned I mean there's what like 27,000 plus pieces that you're tracking you said the size of the cell phone and up but if you take that down to, I, I believe, you know, like a fleck of paint down to one mil millimeter, don't you get like, how many millions is that? Yeah, exactly. So the thing is, because we don't measure these things directly, there's uh, kind of wide hypotheses. But for sure, I, I think the small, the smallest number uh, hypothesizes is over a million. And um, the thing is, these things can be traveling up to like 15 uh, times the speed of a bullet. Uh, you know, relative to something else. And, you know, bu bullets cause a lot of damage at the speed of a bullet, something that even half the size of a bullet traveling 15 times the speed of a bullet. Yeah. I mean, that hit, hits an astronaut suit and it's a bad day. It is a bad day. Is that what led you to, again, another software package that was really impressive that you built, uh, Astriograph? You, you designed this web application to help sort of visualize the objects that we're tracking up there. I believe you did that for the University of Texas. Is that correct? Yeah, so basically, uh, right. So the, the, the FAA and other government uh, agencies put some money into developing kind of this crowdsourced, multi-sourced uh, database of, of stuff in space where, you know, going to the website, it queries the graph database and just kind of shows you locations in, in 3D space of where some of these opinions about stuff in space reside. And uh, yeah, did, did that through the U University of Texas at Austin and uh, just uh, commercialized it uh, under privateer space. See, I'd like to hear more about privateer space too, because again, you're a co-founder of that, uh, along with some other incredible names too, Alex Fielding and uh, Steve Wozniak. Uh, how did you become involved with privateer? Well, um, you know, both Steve and Alex, uh, they knew about me, they reached out to me, um, you know, just, just over a year ago. And, um, you know, they've been following my work and they fully embrace this vision of environmental sustainability and interconnectedness and stewardship. And they're like, 
we see a place for uh, someone to really scale uh, a lot of the work that I had been doing at UT to, to make it more accessible to as many people as possible and that sort of stuff. And um, the idea of being able to have a decision intelligence platform, decision intelligence being kind of the trade craft of manipulating data and information so as to maximize desired outcomes. How can we, because the stuff I'm doing at UT is great on the research perspective, but it's not like robust 24 seven, so, you know, you want to depend on it. You, you, you check, click on it at one o'clock in the morning, everything works fine. No, it's, it's mostly to demonstrate capability, but I feel that we're at uh, another Renaissance. I call it a Renaissance encore uh, for a variety of reasons. And much like in the original Renaissance, most of the art and science that flourished from the original Renaissance happened not because people were getting government grants to do stuff. Uh, it was because of, of one particular family, the Medici. And so one of the things that uh, I've been looking for for years is where's my Medici equivalent? Because as an academic, there's no way that I can get enough kind of funds from you know National Science Foundation, this sort of stuff to make something that can really be operationalized and really global and uh, you know, privateer, there you go. So pri privateer is the Medici equivalent of this new Renaissance for space. That's wonderful. One of the things that you're doing for Privateer, I believe, Wayfinder is sort of the first software package that's coming out and that's based on your ASCII graph. Can you tell us more about Wayfinder and how, how that's different? Yeah, so um, ASCII graph, uh, you know, uses uses Neo4j as, as knowledge graph, uh, you know, software, but um, doesn't, ASCII graph right now isn't something that, um, even though people can go to the website, there's not a whole lot of interaction that people can just like, just like that app Waze, right? I use at, you know, Waze to drive around, you know, Austin. Um, Waze allows users to put in information. Hey, there's a piece of debris here. That information helps other users on the road avoid hazards and that sort of stuff. So that kind of near real time, people get to contribute, get to benefit from it uh, kind of continuously 24 seven. Ask your graph. Uh, was designed to do that, but doesn't do that. And that's what Wayfinder is set to do. So Wayfinder is a re-architecting of that vision of Astrograph, but putting it in a framework that scales and 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 can be operationalized uh, so that it can be put into that near real-time use. And, and, and the name Wayfinder is because of, uh, back to environmentalism and indigenous culture, is uh, this tradecraft of wayfinding when I speak to folks that do that in French Polynesia, Samoa and whatnot, uh, they say, look, when you're out in the middle of the ocean, you're in an outrigger canoe and you're trying to make it from one tiny island to another, you have to have a successful conversation with the environment if you're gonna live through that. And so that is the tradecraft of wayfinding. And so that's what we wanna do at Privateer is we wanna have a successful conversation with the environment so that all of us can thrive. Oh, more about, I think that's incredible. Uh, one thing too, I, I just kind of want to ask sort of the future, so obviously tracking all the space junk, space debris is so important. Um, what are your thoughts on, how do we clean it up just as a society going forward? What are your thoughts on that? Look, um, the first thing that we need to do is, so there's definitely right now, there's objects that we know that should be removed. and. Um, these are like derelict rocket bodies that are pretty much ticking time bombs. There's a couple right. thousand of them. Um, we've seen one Chinese rocket body re-enter and the world was kind of spun up on that. Where's this thing going to land? And, uh, you know, it landed in the ocean. So, um, it's still unfortunate, but at least it didn't land over a populated area. Yeah. There's a couple thousand rocket bodies up there that are ticking time bombs and dangerous and. Uh, they're owned mostly by Russia, the U.S. and China in that order of number numbers. It's not, unfortunately, there's no money to be made out of that, right? And so the thing is, if you say, okay, well, who's going to pay for cleaning the rocket bodies? There's no political will per se to like, anybody who runs in politics on a platform of, on day one in the White House, I'm going to remove five rocket bodies. That, right. sorry, you know. Yeah, no way. <laughs> exactly. So, so I think that in order for the debris to be cleaned, 
it needs to be something where people can make money from it or something that you can really trace to no kidding environmental impact basically show that you know be able to quantify the detriment of this stuff up there in ways that 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 are inarguable and i think that to do that we need to develop sustainability metrics like a carbon footprint analog in space that i call like a space traffic footprint hmm. um um, loosely understood as as the burden that any given object poses on the safety and sustainability of anything else, and even uh, orbital carrying capacity. Given that we put satellites in very particular orbital highways, to then say, okay, the orbital carrying capacity is saturated when our decisions and actions can no longer prevent some th- percentage of undesirable outcomes per month or per week or whatever. And I think having those two things. Then it's easy to say, okay, we've we've measured the, the 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 aggregate space traffic footprint in this orbital highway and its capacity. The capacity is saturated, and the capacity is being consumed by these objects. And these objects are owned by these countries. And if any other country wants to use that orbital space, well, it can't because it's occupied. And so that country could probably then go to the ones that uh, own dead pieces of junk that are taking up capacity for no reason and say, we need to figure out a way to clean this because I should be able to have free, peaceful and unhindered use of outer space for my own country's needs and your junk is taking it up. That's not cool. I'll agree with that. One thing that, that you said, this kind of blew me away too, is just thinking about this, you know, you had the FAA who, who will, you know, can license rockets for the U.S. Whether you can take off and, and where and when, but that's only the U.S. And once you get to orbit, it's pretty much there's no rules. There's nothing. How would you like to see that changed? Yeah. So right now we have international space law is codified in these treaties and conventions, but they're very widely interpreted and implemented. Um, I think the first thing that we need to do is. I tell people, you can't enforce what you don't manage, can't manage what you don't know, and you can't know what you don't measure. So it all boils down to measurements. And I think, which is the whole impetus behind Astrograph and now Wayfinder is, can we assemble the largest compendium of knowledge about stuff in space such that we can have a wide variety of inquiry, draw conclusions from from this measurable set to get some knowledge about how are people actually implementing uh, or complying with different treaties, rules, and regulations. And based on that evidence, then we can have a conversation of, oh, yeah, so the way that you're interpreting this actually isn't meeting the intent. The intent was blank. How can we work together to change that behavior such that we do have space, you know, for, for our children's children and so on and so forth. I think that's the that's the order of operations that we need to go through. Oh, that'd be incredible. Uh, if I may, just one more question. What's next for you in privateer? So we just came out of stealth mode. As you see, we've seen, you've seen the website and Wayfinder and that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, at the end of the day, here's, here's, here's what I want, right? I mean, I want to be able, I want to be able to use space as humanity's mirror so that we can, understand how interconnected things are and the importance of stewardship. So so kind of everything underlying what privateer does is there's that spirit of interconnectedness, the stewardship and um, trying to basically, you know, when you raise the tide, all ships kind of go up sort of thing. And we want to be useful to people. We want to do things in a way that increases human connection across the globe. We want to do things that motivate and improve peace and prosperity as well. Connection, peace, and prosperity. We want to be able to measurably improve these things using our decision intelligence platform and recognizing that we at Privateer, we don't have the answer to this stuff. It takes a community. We want to provide a mechanism that, uh, incentivizes collaboration and partnership and together we can sort some stuff out and along along the way we'll make some money at it and that's okay 
uh, those things can coexist. Doing good things and making money, those can coexist. So um, I think within the next six to 12 months, you'll see more evidence of that spirit come out. Um, yeah. Oh, that'll be fantastic. Well, Morbra, I, again, I want to thank you so much for this. We just wish you and Private Tour the best. I just want to thank you so much for taking time to join me. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, brother. Your space journey. Well, I really enjoyed my conversation with Morba today, and I'm really excited about the future of Privateer Space. Space junk has been a growing problem for years, and I'm so happy that companies like Privateer are stepping up to actually do something about it. If you'd like to learn more, please check out their website at privateer.com. I want to thank Morba for joining us today. I want to thank you for joining us as well. Again, we'd appreciate it if you're watching on YouTube, give us a thumbs up or a like on your favorite podcast application. We'd also appreciate it if you'd share this episode with a friend. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll see you next time. God bless.